also. So after signing the uh, agreement, uh, the United States and the Taliban were uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, they tried to uh, avoid attacking each other. There were no major incidents between the United States and the Taliban, uh, but the Afghan government conducted many airstrikes uh, many civilians died in all corners of the country, uh, in Herat, in Balkh, in uh, uh, Logar, in many parts of Afghanistan, uh, scores of civilians died. And one of the last airstrikes that resulted in many casualties uh, was actually condemned by the United States. The American representative for Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilzad, condemned an airstrike uh, conducted by Afghanistan's air force. So uh, it, it clearly shows that uh, after the uh, agreement in Doha in February uh, this year, uh, President Ashraf Ghani has clearly shown that he's not going to cooperate. And if he's not cooperating, and if this jirga, as we have discussed so far, is another means for him to... Um, delay the process, then uh, the question arises, what is the alternative? What does he have in mind? Because obviously the United States have started withdrawing its troops from Afghanistan. So uh, recently, uh, President Donald Trump has said uh, during an interview with uh, Fox, uh, I believe it was Fox or... It no, was the British journalist... Outlet, yeah, so he told them that uh, by election day, there will be only about four or 5,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan. And after that, they uh, until 2021, they will withdraw all their troops. So, so there will be no f presence of foreign forces in Afghanistan who can protect this government. Uh, and they will also, uh, which, which, is uh, which only makes sense, is that they will also stop uh, funding this government and its armed forces, uh, gradually they will uh, uh, cut back the, the financial support. Uh, so what does Ashraf Ghani have in mind? What do you think that, that he thinks that is going to happen if he continues delaying this peace process? Well, I mean, a lot of parallels are drawn between 1992 and the present day, okay, where Dr. Najib's government collapsed and the civil war broke out uh, amongst the different factions of the Mujahideen. And obviously now uh, another superpower is leaving and could potentially turn off the tap to Kabul. And then there's obviously the fact that both Dr. Najib and Ashraf Ghani are Ahmad Zay, or w one of them was Ahmad Zay and Ashraf Ghani is. Uh, you know, like a lot of people were saying at one point that Ashraf Ghani was waiting potentially if Trump loses the election um, that Joe Biden, who was Obama's deputy, sorry, deputy, uh, vice president, uh, would have a different policy toward Afghanistan. But Joe Biden was pretty, I mean, I know politicians lie, of course they do, but he looked pretty clear in a l recent interview where he said that, you know, the, uh, the, the notion of Afghan women and saving Afghan women and protecting Afghan women against the Taliban was not in his interest. Uh, and that he said that another way, a better way for the US to, you know, uh, promote its values abroad was sort of, you know, on the spectrum of uh, actions taken, you could use economic leverage and that sort of thing, Sa sanctions. Now, obviously, I would say that sanctions are a pretty awful way. Uh, they haven't really demonstrated that they work in any capacity. But the case stands that Joe Biden himself was pretty clear that, you know, he's not going to pursue an alternative policy towards Afghanistan. In fact, Joe Biden has actually said things like Afghanistan should be partitioned into three different countries and that there's no reason for it to be one country. So I think, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I'm not bringing some high level, sophisticated, deep political analysis into this. I would just say, I mean, it's pretty commonsensical that Trump looks pretty clear about America first and not wanting to support governments abroad with the money of US taxpayers. Joe Biden doesn't seem to have any sort of qualms about the Taliban retaking Kabul 
in the event of a civil war. So I would say, you know, it's in the best interests of anyone and everyone. I mean, financially, maybe not, because a lot of people in Kabul, as well as those in Western capitals and Western cities, depend on this war for their so sources of livelihood or their riches. But I mean, this is, this is a road that's only going one way, and it's going off the cliff. Because in a civil war, no one really wins. In the breakdown of a peace agreement that's been signed after, let's say, 10 years of attempts at negotiations for Kabul to try to play spoiler, um, you know, especially when the US's course of action seems pretty clear, counterintuitive, not to speak of its morality. Yes, and one other uh, aspect is that uh, maybe... Um Ashraf Ghani thinks that uh, when the Soviet Union withdrew its troops from Afghanistan, uh, the government of uh, uh, Dr. Najib uh, managed to uh, stay in power all the way until 1992. So the troop, uh, so the Soviet troops le left Afghanistan in 1989, and uh, Najib. Uh, stayed in power until 1992. Um, maybe that, that comparison itself, we spoke about historical determinism. Mm -hmm. That comparison yeah. itself is flawed. Firstly, because Najib did not, Najib's government did not survive due to its own strength or its yes. own superior political savvy or battle, you know. Uh, Najib's government or the Afghan government from Karmal's time to Najib's time was, gif was given, you know, m massive quantities of heavy artillery. Massive, okay? And it had a very strong air force. And the reason that Najib was able to, uh, to remain in power and the much-remembered Battle of Jalalabad in 1989 in which the Mujahideen were defeated and it was the first real victory for the Afghan government. Well, it consisted of disparate, disunited, uh, d you know, divided Mujahideen factions with a lot of backstabbing going on, uh, you know, launching frontal assaults with quite primitive weaponry against, you know, a quite heavily fortified Soviet armed garrison. Najib's government collapsed when Boris Yeltsin cut the subsidies of food and aid to Kabul. The Afghan Air Force could not fly because it didn't have any fuel. So those three years, Najib survived almost entirely because he bought off the right people. He bought off the right Mujahideen factions, which also contributed, funnily enough, to his own collapse. Uh, it survived because the Soviet Union was still pumping billions of of aid into Afghanistan and because his army and his air force though small was actually very strong we're now in 2020 and 2021 the Afghan army is not strong it possesses very primitive weaponry the U.S. has not been as forthcoming and generous with military aid as the Soviets were the, the morale of soldiers is actually at an all-time low they are not paid for months at a time in fact they are not fed a lot of the time so you know the comparison okay one Ahmad Zay and another Ahmad Zay sounds good in theory it doesn't really make any sense it, it's it's really uh, ridiculous to even suggest that 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 this government can stay in power after a departure of foreign forces as you have clearly explained they don't have the military capacity they don't have uh, uh, the, the fuel, the, 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 you know, the ammunition that you need to fight. Uh, and and, and this is another point. This is another point. When the government of Najib collapsed, Kabul was one of the most heavily fortified cities, not just in the country, probably in the region. All right. What the government did, the communist government did during its years was to make sure that Kabul was as fortified as possible. And to yeah. achieve that, Kabul was loaded with so many ammunition caches that it was said, I think popularly, I think we've spoken about it before, that bullets yes. could be fired for nine months nonstop. 
So Najib yes. didn't collapse because of a lack yeah. of weaponry. He collapsed yeah. because he didn't have any fuel to put in his tanks and in his airplanes. And yes. when those ammunition caches fell into the hands of warlords that were allied with uh, factions within Najib's government, that's why the civil war was so deadly, and the, you yes. know, especially for Kabul. Ashraf Ghani yeah. does not have that. In fact, no. it's not unheard of for government soldiers to sell their ammunition to the Taliban. Yeah. And uh, actually, that, you know, that's 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 the biggest uh, source of uh, ammunition and new uh, supplies, weapons, and everything. It's uh, Afghan uh, police officers and Afghan uh, commanders in the uh, Afghan armed forces. They sell uh, Humvees. They sell Ranger trucks. Yeah. They sell. Uh, and a lot of people uh, a lot of people will go on and I myself have spoken a lot about corruption Sanger, give me a second I'm going to turn on the light so yeah the Afghan government have the Afghan government officers have sold Humvees and whatever and I myself have spoken a lot about corruption but for those that are going to go on the corruption uh, uh, tangent here I just want to say if a government is not paying you or feeding you to fight its war then I don't you, you know and you are a poor person fighting in the army just to provide for your family um the moral objections that one could have to selling your weaponry to your adversary fail to hold water because you're not in their position to do so. And uh, once again, like I said, I've been the biggest critic of corruption and corrupt elites within the Afghan government, but to blame the local foot soldier or the local district officer, it doesn't make sense. And the final point, there is no guarantee when in, a, in such a world where Trump is you know, lambasting his own allies in NATO for not paying their fair due, for making America shoulder the burden of financing NATO, why should we assume, why is it a given that Trump is more than happy to provide for the Afghan government to stay in power when its track record is so awful, both militarily and politically? Yeah, like, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, I think that we have reached a, a very clear conclusion that there is no other option, uh, there is no other way. Uh, this government may use this current uh, consultative lawyer, Jorga, as a last uh, resort of delaying, but even after this jirga, there are there isn't much they can do. They have no other option but to release those prisoners and uh, start the intra-Afghan uh, negotiations because that's the only logical and that's the only sensible step to take in order to reach peace in Afghanistan. Inshallah ta'ala. Well, I mean, may it be so. And, uh, you know, I really hope and pray that, you know, Afghanistan can get over, you know, the enmities, the grudges and all of that, because, you know, I think peace should be given a chance. It should be given priority. And I think on that note, we've covered a lot of ground. We went from 1879 Treaty of Gandamak to 2014. Like, it was a bit to and fro. But just to give a better perspective of the function of Jirga, not just in political, in Pashtun uh, society, but also in how it's been used by different rulers of the Afghan state to achieve certain ends. Uh, you know, the, uh, quite an elaborate historic discussion is needed, especially when we're making parallels as we are now. And obviously we spoke about Najib and Ashraf Ghani, the you know the the guys who have generally given the Ahmad Zay tribe their political representation for better or for worse. I have my opinions on which one that has been, but um, yeah, I I will yeah. desist. <laughs> I will desist from uh, okay. giving my opinion on that. And uh, thank you very much to all of the listeners and the viewers. Once again, it's thanks to you that we've got our t-shirts. And for those of us that, for those that are, who are listening to the podcast on audio platforms, 
you know, uh, we still require donations. You know, this sort of what we've discussed today, this kind of thing is sorely lacking from a lot of English media outlets. And not just because of vested interest, as I always attack, but also just because the Afghan know-how and speaking to actual Afghans who understand cultural intricacies and society is missing in a lot of these organizations. A lot of these organizations write for Afghans, but nothing is written by Afghans. Those Afghans that do write, those Afghans that do write are not independent and they are representing a organization or a political ideological aim in whichever capacity that they do. So, and, that- and, and one more point about uh, the, the thing what we are trying to achieve here is, uh, sure, there are many Afghan journalists who are active in all sorts of platforms there are good ones and there are bad ones but the, uh, the, 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 the dominant narrative about Afghanistan uh, the voices, the perspectives they are all generally in favor of war, occupation and foreign intervention in Afghanistan yes, that's the, exactly that, that's, that's the dominant narrative and written, what we are trying to do written, is counter that written by non-Afghans for Afghanistan, about Afghanistan. And so the, every now and again, where by coincidence or by design when an Afghan is there, they're not really in the, representing Afghan interests or Afghans in general in a non-political, in an independent capacity. And I hope that, you know, today serves as another example that, you know, we can, uh, we are people who are trying to make others better understand whether it's Afghans or non-Afghans, better understand Afghan political developments, Afghan cultural history, Afghan diplomatic history, understand it better through an Afghan lens and offer our insight, our, our perspective into the narrative of the vested interests, of the war profiteers, of the arms, of the arms manufacturers, of the ideologically dedicated individuals with a lot of time a lot of energy and a lot of money so i think on that note sangar we'll wrap it up thank you to everyone who listened um like comment subscribe please donate to our channel uh, please donate to our channel please donate to our patreon uh, if you find that our discussions uh, add something to your perspective uh, you can either become a patron on patreon or you could donate to our paypal you can also buy these pretty cool t-shirts of ours and Eid Mubarak to all of the Muslims to all who celebrated Dakhila Hajiya wa Ghaziya Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah